Isn't it good that all the Lord asks is for ashes? Bring me your ashes, God says, and I'll give you beauty. That's about all we have to bring anyways. Bring him ashes or, or uh, mourning. I'll give you the oil of joy for mourning. You just bring your mourning and, and God will trade you. God has a good, uh, good program. Turn to Math, uh, Malachi chapter 3. I chose this text because I feel like it's one of the best kept secrets of the church. You remember those time in Israel when the temple was neglected and needed, needed a lot of work and while they were cleaning things up they found the book of the law in the house of God? Well we're living in a day sort of like that where there's a lot of good things hidden in the house of God and uh, somebody needs to find them. And this, this topic that I've chosen uh, to minister to you tonight. There's not a whole lot said about it, but there's a whole lot of good things in it. And I hope to bring some of those good things out to, uh, to show you and to rejoice in. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. The messenger of the covenant. This is the prophecy of the Messiah. What's the Messiah going to do when he comes? How are we going to recognize him? How are we going to know that he's the Messiah? He's going to bring in a covenant. He's going to establish a covenant. He's going to be the messenger of the covenant. Now in this case, um, this messenger both tells us what the, what the covenant is and he established the covenant. He tells about the work, and he does the work. Normally, the messenger is talking about somebody else, but this messenger tells the message, and he does the work. And we shouldn't be surprised at that, that Jesus does something unique, because he is unique. Jesus does what nobody else can do. If somebody offers you something in the name of Jesus that you can get other places, then it probably isn't Jesus that's going to do it. The messenger of the covenant. Now, I've decided that to preach about the messenger of the covenant, I'm going to define the covenant. And here's my point that I want to make tonight, is that where the messenger of the covenant works, these things will be found. They're undeniable. If the messenger of the covenant is not working in this person, or in this church, or in this message, or what have you, then it's not Jesus. Where Jesus works, this is what he does. It's a tell, they're telltale signs. This is how Jesus works. This is the work that Jesus does. So in an attempt to define the new covenant, it is this. Coming to God on his terms, on his arrangements, and by his provision. That's the covenant. God calls us to him on his terms. Nobody comes to God on their terms. God calls us to him under his arrangements. And God, we come to God by his provisions. You remember Joseph, when he was exalted in Egypt, and his brothers came, and he finally uh, uh, made himself known to his brethren. He called his brethren to bring his father and all of their family down to Egypt, and they were provided for because Joseph was on the throne. They received gifts because their brother was on the throne. And in fact, it said the Egyptians, they loathed shepherds. <laughs> so they wouldn't, they wouldn't have had a spot in the kingdom at all in their land, except that their brother was on the throne. Israel's son, he was on the throne. He was, put, he was made a ruler by, by the Pharaoh. Well, that's what the covenant is. We're blessed because of what he did. Not because of what we do. This is what the covenant is like. We're coming to God. Israel and all of his family, 70 souls it was, they came down to Egypt on Joseph's terms. They came down to Egypt on Joseph's provisions. Amen. They came down to Egypt by Joseph's invitation. Amen. Not anything because of what they did. It was because their brother was on the throne. That's what the new covenant is. We receive these provisions because our older brother's on the throne. It's on his terms. It's on his provisions. There's also another man in Scripture named Mephibosheth. Now, you know him, don't you? He was a son of Jonathan. 
who was, who was the man that David loved. You remember David and Jonathan? Well, after Jonathan and Saul were killed, David said, is there any left of Jonathan's house that he may be blessed? And one of his, one of his, uh, of his men said, yeah, there's Mephibosheth. And uh, he was lame in his feet. So in other words, he wasn't suitable for the king's presence. But Mephibosheth came to eat at the, at the king's table because the king invited him and because the king made arrangements for him, because the king called his name, because the king provided him bread and he ate at the king's table. Well, this is like a shadow of the new covenant. We come to the king's table even though we have, we have a malady. We come to the king's table because of somebody else. Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son. It wasn't anything because he could claim that Jonathan was his, was his father. And by that virtue, he ate at the king's table. This is a shadow of the covenant that we are receiving the provisions of the new covenant, the blessings of the new covenant, the rights of the new covenant, because Jesus is our elder brother. We're coming on his terms, on his provisions, and by his bidding. Now the new covenant is called, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, it's called a will. The covenant is called a will. It says, by the which will we are sanctified. The covenant is a will. Another word for covenant is testament, but it means will. Now here's a point to be made on this. The new covenant is God doing what he wants to do. By the which will we are sanctified. God is doing what he wants to do. The, the gospel is his good pleasure. You remember reading that in the scriptures? Isaiah 46.10, he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. God, in the end, God really does what he wants to do. He might be opposed, but the, the opposition just comes to nothing. God does what he wants to do. We receive forgiveness of sins because God wanted to forgive us. We receive an imputation of righteousness because God wanted to impute it. So the will is, or the covenant is an expression of God's will. Now when you see this, it'll change your prayers. If you haven't been one of these people, then you've probably known somebody that was like this. Somebody that desperately wanted to be forgiven by God and accepted by God, but just didn't think God wanted to forgive them. Well, you look at the gospel, you look at what Jesus did, you look at what God did to Jesus, and you should conclude that God wants to forgive you. Amen. That's the new covenant. God is doing what he wants to do. Hebrews 10.10, 10 is, is, he calls it the will. Ephesians 1.5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Oh, this, now this changes the way people come to God. We realize, I want to come to God because God wants me to come. I want to be cleansed of my sins because God wants to cleanse me of my sins. So all the time that people have been, have been begging and pleading for God to forgive them, God's been waiting for them to realize his forgiveness. So the new covenant is, a, is an expression of God's will. Now by way of contrast, this covenant was drawn up by God and Christ, not by God and us. There are covenants and testaments in the world where the enemies sit down at one table and they draw up a covenant. And this is the way, this is the arrangements between these two parties to come together. Well, this is not the way God draws up covenants. Covenants in this world, there's a little bit of giving from one side, there's a little bit of taking from the other side, and then there's a little bit of taking from this side and a little bit of giving on that side, and hopefully they, they, they meet somewhere in the middle of the road with a happy medium and then they call it a covenant of peace. And they're, now they're at peace. Well, God doesn't do it like that. God drew the covenant. He made all the provisions. He made all the conditions. And then he called his enemies. This is completely different. I wouldn't have it any other way but to come to God on his terms. I wouldn't want to come to God on any, any other way but the way that he provided. The new covenant now was promised long before the old. The, the old, the, see, the old was implemented first, and then the new was implemented after that, but the, old, the new covenant actually was long before. The book of Hebrews talks about the law being added. 
Remember uh, Galatians chapter 3 says the, 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 trans, or the, the law was added 430 years later. Added what? Added to the promise that God gave to Abraham. The, co the new covenant, it was, it was promised long before. In fact, when God found Adam and Eve and disapproved of their clothes and he gave them coats of skins, that was, that was a promise of the new covenant. God was saying, however you find to cover yourselves, it's not going to be approved. I'm going to cover you. I'm going to cover you. I'm going to pr provide what I require. When we come to God, see, remember the, uh, the, 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 the feast, the wedding, the wedding supper? The, the goodman of the house, the father, he provided the feast and he provided the clothes. And that's what the new covenant's doing. We come and we just bring ashes. And we get all the provisions of the new covenant. So the new covenant was promised long before the old. God told Abraham to offer his son, his only son, on a mount that he would show him. As they were ascending up the mount, Ab uh, Isaac said, here's the fire, here's the wood, where's the offering? And Abraham promised the new covenant. He said, God will provide himself a lamb. That's the new covenant. God provided it. The old covenant reminded the people of their sins every year. The new covenant reminds us that our sins are gone. Amen. The old covenant said keep the people away when God came down on the mount. The new covenant says come near to the throne of grace. Amen. The blessings of the old covenant depend on our works. The blessings of the new covenant depend on his works. Amen. The new covenant actually preceded the old. The new covenant actually made us ready. Or the old covenant actually made us ready for the new. This new covenant, of which Jesus is the messenger, is an exploit of the grace and wisdom of God. When God, when God started the, the whole salvation plan, his intentions was to show his grace and show his wisdom. He's going to put his wisdom on display. He's going to put his grace on display. The book of Hebrews tells us this. Ephesians 2.7 it says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness through us, through Christ Jesus. That he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Now, God could show his power on Pharaoh, but he didn't show his grace on Pharaoh. God showed his power in creation, but he didn't show his grace in creation. He shows his grace in the covenant. On the, on the people of God. And then again in Ephesians 3.10, it says, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. God's displaying his wisdom. See, God really couldn't just save us by power. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. It's not just, it's not, it's not simple. It's not as simple for God to just speak his word like he spoke the creation into existence. God couldn't just speak us out of sin and speak us out of the fall. No, he had, there's, there's some wisdom required. And so God wanted to display his grace to these principalities and powers. God wanted to display his wisdom, and in, in this covenant is how he's doing it. His wisdom and his grace is being displayed. Power can deliver Israel out of Egypt, but it takes much more than that to deliver people from this present evil world. Power can make the army of Israel overcome the cities of Canaan, but it takes more than power for you and I to overcome this present evil world. It took power to create the world and all things in it in six days, but it takes more than power to create a new creation in righteousness and true holiness in the sons of Adam. It takes grace and it takes wisdom to do that. Now I want to go to Hebrews chapter 8, which a, a parallel text is found in Jeremiah chapter 31, but I'm going to read from uh, Hebrews chapter 8. And I want to show you how that when Jesus showed up on the scene in planet Earth, not only did he talk about this covenant, but he's the one that accomplished it. Okay? Hebrews chapter 8. Solomon said, a child is known by his works. So is Jesus. He's known by his works. And this new covenant that I want to show you is his work. This is, this is the commission that God gave him to do when he sent him into the world. Verse 8 of Hebrews 8 and following. 
For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That's the New Testament. That's the New Covenant. That's the covenant that God and Christ made. When Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, this is what he was talking about. The covenant was established. It was finished. Jesus didn't mean that his works were finished. He went back to heaven and he ever lives to make intercession for us. So his works weren't complete. The covenant was finished. Now we can draw near to God. Now righteousness can be imputed. Now we can be accepted in the presence of God. Now we are reconciled to him. Where Jesus works, these things will be found. The law is internalized. Amen. It's put into the mind and written in the heart. God is revealed, understood, and made known. And finally, sin is forgiven. These are like, three, these are like Jesus' specialties. If you come to God and you don't want these things, Jesus doesn't have anything for you. This is what he does. He's going to put the law in your inward parts. Remember David said, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, because that's where it really does its work. You could put all the Bible in your pocket, all of all the Bobby you want in your pocket, until it gets in your heart, it's not going to do you any good. So this, these works are the telltale works of the Messiah. Where Jesus works, God is known. Where Jesus works, the word of God ha is at home in people. Where Jesus works, they're forgiven and uh, delivered from sin. This is the work of Jesus. So I want to I wanna open these, th these three things up. The old covenant put the law on the doorpost of the house. So God said you look at it when you rise up, you look at it when you lay down. You look at it when you go out, you look at it when you come in. You look at it in the morning, you look at it in the evening. But it didn't change anybody. But this covenant puts the law in the inward parts of men and women. This covenant puts the law in the mind and it puts it in the heart. So then you're looking at it when you rise up in the morning and when you lay down at night. You're looking at the law when you go out and when you come in because it's in the inward parts. It's like the law forced people to think about what God said. <laughs> well, the new covenant makes you love what God said. It internalizes it. Now, you, you just try to put God's word in your heart. I'm sure all of us have done this. You try to put it in there, and it just won't stay. But when Jesus puts it in there, it stays. You try to write it in your heart, and you can't get it to stay. But when Jesus writes it in your heart, it stays. Now, what's the purpose of this? Writing it in the heart and putting it in the mind. God is going to change how you think, and God's going to change what you love. That's the heart and the mind. That's the heart and the mind. He's going to change how you think. He's going to change what you love. Amen. That heart that was deceitful and desperately wicked, it'll have the law written in it. The mind that did not like to retain God in its knowledge, that mind will love the law of God. See, we were at, at, in time past, we were like the, the world of Noah's day. When the dove left the ark, flew around and found no place to rest her foot, so she came back. Well, the law, when the word of God came to us and perused around our inward parts, it found no place to rest its foot till Jesus made a place. Jesus wrote the word, wrote the law in our heart, put it in our minds, so now when the dove of truth comes to us, ah, it can rest. It can rest in our inward parts. It finds a place. It finds a home. Now the word of God can richly dwell within you and effectively work within us. Now, Understand that the Lord isn't going to just put the book of Romans in your mind so that tomorrow you can quote long passages of Scripture. Putting the law in the mind and writing it in the heart is a foundation that makes us workable material for Jesus. Amen. So now when the word does come to you, it finds a place. It can do its work. It can direct your thoughts. It can direct your affections. It can move, it can move around in you. 
That's what this word, it provides a foundation. When the law is written in the mind, then his commandments are not grievous. Oh, it doesn't testify against you now. It's written in your mind. It's, agree it, it find, it's agreeable with you. It's not grievous anymore. When the law is written in our hearts, it takes the tediousness out of running the race that's set before us. When the law is put in the heart, then God is in all of his thoughts. That's one of the indictments that God had against the wicked. He said, God is not in all of his thoughts. But when the law is put in there, then God is in all of his thoughts. This is the work that Jesus does. Amen. When the law is written in the mind, then our thoughts are his thoughts. When the law is put in the heart, then our ways are his ways. Now in the prophets, he had to say, your ways are not my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than yours. But Paul didn't say that, did he? Peter didn't say that when he wrote to the church. John didn't say that when he wrote to the church. In fact, Paul said, we have the mind of Christ. So God doesn't say anymore, my ways aren't your ways. That's what reconciliation is all about. He makes our ways to be his ways. So you know, now we can sit down at the same table and have no qualms with one another. That's what reconciliation is all about. That's a, that's a work of the law being internalized. Now the law feels at home in people. We can dwell together in unity with the law. We can sit down at the table, we sit down at the same table with the law, and we don't have any problems with it, and it doesn't have any problems with us. That's the work of Jesus. The law used to cause heaviness, but now it causes joy. The law used to, used to convict us, but now it comforts us. When the law is written inside the people, then the Holy Spirit has material to work with. Now God can order your steps when the law is written in your heart. Now our hearts can be directed by him because the law is written in our hearts. Now we can follow his voice because we know his voice because his law is written in our hearts. Now we can follow his eye because we know his ways because the law is written in our hearts. Nobody can put, see, nobody can integrate the law or the word of God into people like Jesus can. The scripture talks about the engrafted word. Receive the engrafted word with meekness, which is able to save your souls. The engrafted word is the new covenant way of saying, write the law in your hearts and put it in your minds. Now, when something's grafted or engrafted, at the beginning, it's obvious that two things have been stuck together. Have you ever seen trees grafted together? There's rubber bands and there's ties and there's cuts where these trees, these plants are put together, they're grafted together, but you give it time and after a while that engrafting you wouldn't be able to tell because the two grow together. And that is Jesus' work. So that when you hear, when you hear people talk, it, it's, they, they speak scripture. They, you can tell that the Word of God is part of them and they are part of the Word. Excuse me. I needed that. The engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. Now, here's an example of this. What, what does the engrafted Word do in people? Paul prayed three times about the thorn in the flesh. When Jesus revealed to him, my strength is made perfect in weakness, Paul got the message. That's what the engrafted Word does. God, the Lord didn't have to drive Paul and keep driving Paul and keep driving Paul and reminding him. No, he gave Paul the message one time and Paul said, Oh, gladly, therefore, glory in mine infirmities. Amen. See, that was because the word was engrafted in Paul. God had to tell the Israelites over and over and over and over again to remember my laws and to keep my statutes and to fear me and to teach your children but he didn't Paul, tell Paul over and over again my strength is made perfect in weakness my strength is oh Paul got the message because the word was engrafted now you understand that it's more than just the Ten Commandments that are written in our hearts the the law is an expression of God's mind it's an expression of God's nature so when it's written in our hearts, it's more than just that we have constant thoughts of do not murder, do not murder. It's much more than that. It's, that, that is the integration of the law of God into the, into the inward parts is what makes us agreeable with God. Now there are several things. I wanted to provide a contrast on this point. 
several things uh, that I'm sure you have heard some of these, but just to provide a, con a contrast of, of uh, when the law of God is not written in the heart, then people have said things like that. They read, read in the scriptures and then somebody says, well, this is what the text says, but I wouldn't have said it like that. <laughs> well, that, means, that tells me the, that, that word wasn't written in their heart. I've heard people read the scriptures and then say, well, that's not really what it means. I know that's what it says, but that's not what it means. I heard it said once, well, if we don't know, if it doesn't mean what it says, how are we supposed to know what it means? <laughs> I don't know if he remembers this or not, but in one uh, study, Bible study that I was at, my brother Jason said this, this text. He says, well, there is no law, neither is there transgression. And somebody said, I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> well, that's Romans chapter 4. Well, somebody said that because maybe it wasn't written on their heart. My father, Brother Gene, he was reasoning with somebody about what Paul wrote about immorality in 1 Corinthians. And this person responded by saying, well, that's just Paul's opinion. I don't think the law was written on the heart. See, when the law is in the heart, it makes people agreeable with God. The Word of God will stop you in your tracks if it needs to. And then there's the terrible sy syndrome of Yabbat. Yeah, <laughs> Reading the scripture and say, Yabbat. Yeah, and then there's a lot of things that have followed that statement. You see, when the word of God is, is part of you and grafted, well, you're agreeable with it. If there's any difference, then you want to change to be in line with it. So the messenger of the covenant is going to take the ways of God, the nature of God, the will of God, the, the message of God, and he's going to make it part of you. That's the, that's the work of this messenger. Now here's the second thing. They shall all know me. When God sent the Son to the earth, he came with this commission to make God known. John said it this way. No man has seen God at any time, but he that is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Jesus came to make God known. They shall all know me. Now Moses knew God, but the rest of the people didn't. David knew God, but the rest of the people didn't. Daniel knew God, but not very many people did. But in this covenant, everybody knows God, from the least to the greatest. It sounds like God wanted to really get this point across. From the least to the greatest. Not just the priests anymore. They shall all know me. That's one of the benefits of the covenant. That's one of the commissions of this messenger. This is one of his works. When Jesus gets to work, God is revealed. Amen. It's one of his works. There is really nothing better than understanding the one who is wisdom. Amen. Just think about what the mind is capable of understanding. Just in, just in general uh, general terms, medical advancements today. What the mind of man has been able to, to achieve. Scientific developments. What the mind has been able to grasp. And technological accomplishments just continue day by day. But Richard Baxter, he said this, which I've loved ever since I read it. He said, the understanding was created with a certain bias to the truth. That is, God created the understanding and the mind that he put in man to understand him. It's created with a certain bias. It's like it, it has a bent toward understanding its creator. When the understanding comprehends God, then is when the understanding is really in its groove. That's really what it's made for. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him. Now, Paul had accomplished a lot of things. You remember, he listed it in Philippians chapter 3. But in the view of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, he threw it all out. And he didn't do it with any regret. He gladly threw it out. Why? Because knowing him was better than all that. Amen. And that's what the covenant does. There's a lot of things that can pull at the heart of man. There's a lot of things that can capture the affection of men. But nothing can pull as deeply as when God shows himself to a man. It will cause a person to sell all that he has and with joy buy the field. 
It will convince Paul to consider everything else but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. They shall all know me. Now, knowing God is, is a matter of revelation, not a matter of research. God has to be revealed. He can't be found out. That's why it's the work of Jesus. If you haven't learned this already, then you probably will. But Jesus doesn't do things that other people can do. Uh, Brother Tony mentioned this this afternoon. He healed a blind man that was born blind. <laughs> so then you didn't say, oh yeah, that doctor down there must have done that. He's done that one before. No, he did something that had never been heard on this wise. And Jesus is the one that reveals God. Knowing God is much more than gathering facts and figures. God is known by experience. When we find the Lord walking on the water of our storm, and he gets into our boat, and that's when we begin to know him. Amen. When we find the Lord walking and opening the scriptures to us on our road to Emmaus, and our hearts burn within us, that's when the Lord's revealing himself. That's when God is known. It's by experience. When we see him in our fiery furnace walking about and our bonds have been burned out or have been burned off, but no one is hurt by the flames, that's when God is known by that experience. God can't be known like history is known. God has to be revealed, and that's what Jesus came to do. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 he said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. See, God makes himself known at his discretion, not ours. Amen. That's why there's a promise today that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen. Now, because we were waiting on him to reveal himself. That's why, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Because if you put off the opportunity that he opens to you, you might not have it again tomorrow. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Well, some have supposed that, that you, can, you can find him in any time, but that's not, that's not the case because God is also a God that hides himself. The book of Isaiah and the book of Psalms both say this. Thou art a God that hideth thyself. He hides himself and he reveals himself. He does it at his discretion because he knows when it's good for us that he step behind the experience and we can't find him. And he knows when it's good when he when it's good for us that he steps out from behind the experience and we find him. God is known in experience. Knowing God is the only basis that God allows us to glory, to boast, to be proud. It says, let not, the glory, let not him, let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. All other boasting is excluded. But you can boast in this, that you know God. Why? Because you didn't find him. God revealed him. Jesus taught you of the Father. Our seeking is only effective when he's revealing. Our knocking is only effective when he's opening. And in fact, you might have to knock more than once before he opens. Now the Lord lamented... <clears throat> It's recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. The people were scared at Mount Sinai. They said, we'll do all he commanded us to do. Well, that was good intentions. It just didn't last very long. And so when the Lord heard him say that, that he lamented and said, oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. Well, God doesn't lament like that anymore. He's giving them that kind of heart. When he reveals himself, Oh, you don't, his commandments are not grievous. When you know the Lord, they shall all know me. Now, God has longed for a people. There, there's, there's a lot of lamentations such like that found in the prophets. God lamenting over the people that go astray. Amen. And that they, they, they trade. They trade what he gave them for what the nations have. They run after the nations. They go down into Egypt for help instead of coming to me. God lamented about the condition of the people. God never was satisfied out of people doing what he commanded them to do only because he commanded it. God never was pleased with people obeying just so they wouldn't be killed. God never was pleased with the people like that. In fact, Jesus said, after you've done all that the law has commanded you to do, say... We are unprofitable servants. 
We've only done that which is our duty to do. Well, how are you going to do more than that which is your duty to do? You've got to know God. When you know, when you know God, when, you're, when you know His ways, you're reconciled to Him, you're, you have fellowship with Him, well, then you delight to do His will, just like God did. I come to do Thy will, O God. That'll be your testimony, too. The disciples came back to the well and, and said, Eat, Master. And He said, I have food that ye know not of. And they, they questioned back and forth to themselves, and Jesus says, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me, and to finish His work. And it'll be our meat, too, when we know Him. Now, 1 John 5.20 says, We know the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. God has sent the Son to give us this understanding of Himself so that He would have a people that would follow Him and not turn to the right or to the left. So that He would have a people who would learn when He speaks and not require a rod Peter did deny Jesus one night, but he didn't again. What was the difference? The messenger of the covenant revealed God. There was a, the disciple said, just show us the Father. It suffices us. Well, he didn't ask that anymore. Because God was revealed to him. Saul did persecute the church, but Paul helped the church. What was the difference? An understanding was given to him. To know the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing else will suffice for a lack of knowing God. There is no substitute for knowing God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10, which is a quotation of the Psalms, he says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart. Why? They have not known my ways. Every error is a result of not knowing God. The last thing here that I wanted to make known from Hebrews chapter 8, that this is the work of the messenger, not only to internalize the law and graft the word, not only to make God known from the least of them to the greatest, but all this requires that God be merciful to their unrighteousness and that God remember their sins and iniquities no more. God doesn't just forgive sins because he wants to. God forgives sins because Jesus gave him a reason to do it. God didn't just lower the standard. He didn't just lower the bar so now we don't look as bad as we used to. God can't just throw away the file of our record of wrongs. God had to do something with it. God is the one who proclaimed us as guilty. God's the one that came up with a verdict. There is none righteous, no, not one. Who said that? God. If God's the one that proclaims us guilty, and God's going to be the one that overturns his own verdict, then God has to really do a work. See, the new covenant doesn't change God. It doesn't change God, it changes us. See, we've heard, we've heard people say, well, I'm, I'm glad we've got this new covenant. We don't have to do all those things the law commanded us to do. Jesus came and really made it easier on us. Well, Jesus said, the law said, thou shalt not murder. But I say unto you, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. Jesus didn't make it easier. He made it harder. God's going to remember our sins no more. I remember one of the key brethren. I don't remember if it was Roy or Harold. Maybe Brother Leon would remember. But he said this, the good news isn't good news till you get the bad news. <laughs> the bad news is you're guilty. The good news is I'll remember your sins no more. The standard that God used to find us guilty is the same standard that God is going to use to find us justified. He's not changing standards. The new covenant changed us. I will remember their sins no more because Jesus took them away. I will remember their sins no more because the offering that Jesus provided was sufficient. I will remember their sins no more because God was pleased to bruise him. 
putting him to grief. Romans chapter 4, verse 8 says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Why will he not do it? Because there's, somewhere, there, there's a place now, God says, there's, a, there's something I can do with that sin if you'll confess it. I can do something with that sin when you confess it. Throw it in the sea of forgetfulness. Remove it far from you so far as the east is from the west. See, God already had a lot of reasons to cut us off. Now he has a reason to forgive us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. God didn't have to look very far for a reason to condemn us. But God had to provide his own reason to forgive us. And that's what he has done in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what a good sound this is to people who are burdened by their sin. This is the kind of people that Jesus was talking to when he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That's the kind of people he was talking to, to people that are bothered by their sin. Heavy laden by their sin. See, it's David's sin bothered him. When Nathan came, the prophet Nathan came to David, and he said, What will be done to this man? After he talked about the man that took the sheep and from his poor neighbor. And David said, you ought to be killed. And Nathan said, thou art the man. Oh, when David's sin came home to him, go read Psalm 51. Thy hand was heavy upon me, presseth me sore. What a good sound forgiveness is to those who are burdened by their sins. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. See, God doesn't use sleight of hand to, to take away our sin. We really did sin, and God really did take it away. Amen. See, in the, court of, in the court of man, an honest lawyer is only going to take a case for somebody that really didn't do it. I can justify you from this because I, I found out that you, didn't, you really didn't do it. But see, in the court of heaven, God only takes guilty cases. God says, I'm only going to represent your case if you admit your guilt. Then I'll take your case. That's what, that's what the scripture means when he said, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the people that stand and pray and say, thank thee, Lord, that I'm not like other men. He won't even take their case. He won't, even, he won't represent them. But to the man that stands over by the way and won't even lift his head up to heaven, but smites his breast and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God says, I'll take your case. I'll remember your sins no more. Because God is, Jesus has provided God a reason to forgive the guilty. Amen. See, God said, I will by no means clear the guilty. That's what he said in the, in the old scriptures. I will by no means clear the guilty. But the new covenant comes along and says, I'll remember their sins no more. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Jesus revealing to John, he said, Who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus is the only one that can wash someone in his own blood. If anybody else offered their own blood, that'd be the last thing they did. But when Jesus offered his blood, now... He's washing us from our sins in his own blood. And you and I know, speaking as a man, that took a lot of scrubbing. Could you cover one sin? The scripture says the thought of foolishness is sin. You know, one of the problems today is that the definition of sin is, has been changed. Sin has been equated to lying. You know, lying's one of the, that's, that's one of those we can kind of look over but then the, the real bad sin, of course, that, those are, that's murder and the obvious immorality stuff. We've got we to gotta deal with those things. But God's definition of sin is you have a foolish thought. That's sin. Acts chapter 13, verse 39 says, By him all the believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. The law of Moses came to remind us of our sins, to give us an acute awareness that you can't, here's your condition, and you can't do anything about it. That was the ministry of the law, from which we could not be justified by the law of Moses. 
The law wrote out the, the guilty verdict and, and kept putting it in front of our face. You're guilty. You're guilty, but it didn't do anything about it. Couldn't do anything about it. That was the ministry of the law. It was the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. What was the lesson of the law? You're guilty. That was the lesson of the law. When you, are, when you can say, wretched man that I am, then you, you graduate from the school of law. Then you've learned the lesson, wretched man that I am. Now you're ready for grace. Now you're ready for, I will remember their sins no more. We know that whatsoever thing the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. And when, when they're guilty, then they're ready for forgiveness. Well, when God remembers our sins no more, because Jesus has taken them away, then the accuser won't be able to open his mouth. See, the devil can remind us of our sins now. But we can remind him that they were taken away. It, now our, our heart can, our minds can go back and dredge up all kinds of things that we wish we didn't remember. But when, they co when those things come up, just remember that he took them away. I will remember their sins no more. I'll leave you with just this scripture. It's Romans 3.26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth on Jesus. See, Jesus has given God, see God's always been just. His, ju his justice has never been compromised. Nobody is ever or ever will be able to accuse God of saying or doing or thinking wrong. He's just. Nobody can ever pin any wrongdoing on God. He's just. And so because of that, see being the justifier, oh God had to do it right, didn't he? God couldn't just brush the sin under the carpet. God couldn't just overlook the sin. God couldn't just change the standards. If he's going to be just and the justifier, then he has to have a sin bearer. And Jesus gave God a reason to remember our sins no more.